So Novorest was uh, founded because of the of a really big problem in the market uh, where obstructive sleep apnea patients are prescribed with CPAP machines, uh, but more than half of them cannot adhere to therapy, uh, including my own father that has severe sleep apnea. Uh, he could not uh, use his CPAP for the four hours period of time that's required by insurance. We uh, gathered a team together and a very innovative team and came up with solutions that are now uh, state of the art. Our company, Novoresp, has come up with a patented AI-enabled software called SEMA, which stands for Continuous Management of Airway, Airway Pressure. This software can uh, sit on the processor of any CPAP machine in the market uh, reads from the air pressure and air airflow sensors of the machine, which every machine has those sensors, and uh, does its calculations and sends orders to the air blower of the machine, which every machine does have. And what it does is that it's been because it's been trained by breathing patterns of many patients, it knows when an apnea is coming. So with a gentle intervention, prevents those apneas, and also. Because it's confident in those probabilities of upcoming apneas, uh, after an intervention, you can come back down in pressure pretty quickly. By doing so, throughout the night, the average pressure of therapy lowers by a lot, uh, while the efficacy of therapy being measured by apnea hypopnea index, the number of apneas you get per hour, remains effective. So it's effective therapy at lower pressures, it helps patients with all the discomfort issues that they deal with uh, during PAP therapy. So as an investor in NovaRest, the first thing that appealed to me was the idea of making CPAP better. Um, my training is, uh, my, my background is as an otolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon. Most people call those ENTs. And we get sent a lot of patients uh, looking for the surgery as an uh, as a, uh, alternative to CPAP. And what I explain to patients about surgery is that there are several surgeries that you can look at performing that will help with snoring and to a certain extent sleep apnea. However, it's an evolving problem. So most of these are stopgap measures. And it's well known even among ENT surgeons that do these surgeries that the gold standard really is and always, you know, and will be for the foreseeable future CPAP. And CPAP will adjust as patients' sleep apnea gets worse, which it tends to as we get older and as we get heavier. The big problem, as Hamed indicated, is compliance with that therapy. And after a, year's, uh, after a year on CPAP, compliance is probably in the range of 50%. And so any technology that can improve that compliance, improve the adherence of patients long term, is a great thing for the, for the patient and for the industry as a whole. It is estimated that about 1 billion people globally are affected by obstructive sleep apnea, 80% of which are undiagnosed. So the awareness is increasing uh, on obstructive sleep apnea, including Samsung and Apple Watch starting to diagnose, getting approvals to diagnose um, signs of obstructive sleep apnea. But out of the 20% of patients that are actually diagnosed and prescribed with CPAP machines, uh, more than 50% cannot comply or adhere to therapy within the first three months. And then the numbers go even lower after that. After five years, which is the shelf life of the device, there's only 15 to 20% patients left on the machine. Um, improving comfort of patients and helping them not only adhere to therapy in the beginning, but remain on therapy after that is um, beneficial from multiple uh, point of view. Uh, Dr. Smith can um, talk about the benefits to a DME uh, and the patient, but for manufacturers, Medicare covers the cost of the machine if you use it more than four hours a night uh, in the first three months of use. There's a window of time that you have that if in that rolling window, patients end up using it more than four hours a night, they qualify for reimbursement of the machine itself. After that, there is quarterly reimbursement for uh, consumables, resupply, um, that influences the manufacturer and the DME if they cannot sell that to the patient because they're not using their machines anymore. Um, so it's a big, big problem. 
So uh, DMEs are companies which help patients adjust to CPAP. Um, the process of doing that is often time consuming. Um, you're, you're trying to convince patients to try a completely different form of therapy. Uh, many patients will come in and say, I could never wear a mask, and they'll put a full hand in front of their face as if they're wearing something that's going to be um, impossible for them to get used to. And once they try CPAP, most patients will find it's not as bad as they think. But the biggest problems with patients becoming adherent to CPAP and staying on CPAP surround the, uh, the pressures that are, um, that are pushed through uh, the machine. And we know that by lowering those pressures, then there's less mask leak, which can be disruptive to the patient, but not only the patient, but the patient's partner. Um, they t the machine tends to blow less air into their stomach called aerophagia, which affects about 15 or 16 percent of patients. So there's less of that. And patients don't have to have the mask as tight to prevent those leaks, which means that the mask itself is more comfortable. There's less marks on the face in the morning that they have to contend with. And generally, the pressures really dictate how comfortable the patient is, how likely they are to adhere to the therapy and to stay on the therapy. So anything we can do to lower those pressures in NovaResp's case by having a learning algorithm that, that allows the CPAP to be just as effective but at a, at a much lower pressure, it's a good thing for the patient. It's a good thing for the market. From a standpoint of competition, uh, to CPAP therapy, number one, uh, there is neurostimulators and there are GLP-1 pills that help with weight reduction and reduction of, you know, the amount of um, amount of um, collapse uh, severity that the patient is experiencing. Um, however, they're, they haven't proven to work on severe sleep apnea cases uh, yet. Um, there is neurostimulators that are minimally invasive uh, in terms of an implant um, and surgery option that you really don't want to do it until until you really have to. CPAPs remain as the most effective therapy out there. Uh, it's been known that there are two types of solutions while applying CPAP therapy. The, the algorithm of CPAP therapy is called auto-adjusting uh, PAP therapy, uh, called APAP. What it does is that it increases the pressure reactively after you get apneas uh, during during sleep. And by increasing those pressures, um, they hope that more apneas wouldn't happen. But more breathing abnormalities would happen, and these pressures increase and increase. Um, the benefit of increasing the pressure to that extent is that, you know, uh, the severity of sleep apnea that's measured by AHI, the apnea hypopnea index, remains low at a healthy range. So patient is treated, except that now we have the discomfort problem. Alternatively, uh, companies could choose to lower the pressure of therapy and don't increase the pressure as much as others, uh, but there are consequences, and that's AHI increases. You're just going to simply get more apneas. What CMAP, our software, does is that it reduces the pressure of therapy without compromising uh, the efficacy of therapy because we're preventing the extra apneas that would occur by reducing the pressure of therapy. Uh, in that sense, we are unique. There is no competition. Our patents protect us. And uh, we've shown efficacy of our treatment in our trials. Um, and, and we'd uh, be commercialized by 2026 on uh, existing manufacturers' machines. We ran a 50-patient trial on already adherent patients. Uh, it's a randomized, blinded crossover trial where patients got to use the same machine but with two different algorithms on it. These are already adherent patients. Uh, they're comfortable with their therapy already. They've been using their machine for over, over four years in cases. Um, they start week one. Half of the patients start week one with... APAP, which is a conventional therapy, and half of the patients start with CMAP. And then halfway through, they switch over. Um, they also fill out questionnaires where they would rate their comfort and sleepiness of the specific week. 
we also used a ring called sleep image ring uh, where uh, it would score sleep staging based on cardiopulmonary coupling. Uh, by doing so, we could actually track uh, measures such as stable sleep, unstable sleep, fragmentation, periodicity uh, of uh, the sleep of the specific week. The results were pretty uh, good for us. Uh, we, On this unknown population, we managed to reduce the pressure by 20% without compromising therapy efficacy, so they were treated. We did not expect... Uh, the comfort and sleepiness of these patients to improve, but it did in a statistically significant way. Um, another measure that it improved was the sleep quality index scored by the sleep image ring. Uh, it showed that we significantly improved um, stable sleep, reduced unstable sleep, improved REM, reduced fragmentation, and most importantly, we reduced uh, the 95th percentile leak. That's the kind of leak that would uh, whistle or blow out of the mask, wakes you up and wakes your partner up. Um, we reduced that significantly. It was pretty surprising to us that we could even improve performance on already existing machines. And if you remember, adherence to therapy reduces down the line. After five years only 20% of patients are still on the machine. If you can improve therapy on existing machines so they feel the benefits of their CPAP therapy even more, there is a higher chance that they'll keep using their machine. And that's, that's, a, that's huge.